All right. We've uh, managed to squeeze our way through the first three articles of the Constitution, legislative, judicial, or legislative, executive, and judicial. Now we're going to go on to Article 4. Article 4 basically talks about how the states and federal government were going to interact, and it also sets up state citizens. So let's go to page 33 and read Article 4, Section 2. It says, The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. Notice, please, that the word citizen is capitalized. Okay? And you are a citizen of each state. So let's fill in the blanks. A citizen of Texas shall, have, shall be entitled all the privileges and immunities as citizens of Florida, citizens of California, citizens of Oklahoma. So what kind of citizens are we talking about? State, state. state citizens. When the founding fathers got together to form the Constitution, Benjamin Franklin would stand up and announce, introduce himself as a citizen of Pennsylvania. Thomas Jefferson was a citizen of Virginia. You are a citizen of your state. A United States citizen was just kind of an abstract concept. You know, it's like one of those many. We don't, we're not going to list all 50 of them. So it's an abstract concept. So, but you have privileges and immunities. Is that good to have privileges? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends. What it, what it was doing, if you are a citizen of Texas, are you a citizen of Oklahoma? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So when you go from the United States to France, do you get all of the, the things that citizen, French citizens do? No, because you're out of your territory. So if you are a Texas citizen and you go to Oklahoma, you don't have all the same rights that you know Oklahoma citizens do, except for Section 2, which says that you will have all the privileges and immunities of citizens of the several states. So legally, you don't have rights, but we're going to extend you those same privileges. So that basically, it's you know all 50 states are the same. But you are a state citizen, and they are extending you these privileges when you go to the other states. Now let's go to the uh, 14th Amendment on page 48. <coughs> the 14th Amendment, section 1, says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Well, that doesn't sound terribly <coughs> onerous, does it? That sounds pretty simple. Okay. But let's look at citizens of the United States. That's a lowercase c. And they left out the word citizen the second time, but it's you're a citizen of the United States and a citizen of the state wherein you reside. So what is that? That's dual citizenship, isn't it? You're a United States citizen and a state citizen. Well, which one comes first? United States citizen. So in that clause, which one takes precedence? United States citizen. Well, it still doesn't take sound too bad, except when you go back and read the second line. It says, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. What are the people in England called living under the king? Subject. Subject. <coughs> Do they have any say so? No. The king says you're going to do this or else. A subject has no rights. You want to be subject to anybody? I don't. Now, the fact that it's a lowercase c is not, you know, a mistake. It also says all persons born or naturalized in the United States. What's a person? Oh, well, good. So if we look at uh, page 20 in your handout, a person, in, and this is from uh, Black's Law Dictionary, in general usage, a human being, i.e. a natural person. 
So when we are talking in conversation, we mean, you know, warm flesh and blood body. Though, by statute, the term may include labor organizations, partnerships, associations, corporations, legal representatives, trustees, trustees in bankruptcy, or receivers. See 29 U.S.C. 152. That's Title 29 of the United States Code, Section 152. And the scope and delineation of the term is necessary for determining those to whom 14th Amendment of the Constitution affords protection, since this amendment express, expressly applies to person. A corporation is a person within the meaning of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection and Due Process Clause. So Ford Motor Company is a person. Microsoft is a person for legal terms. Isn't that wonderful? You get all the same privileges as Microsoft. Now, what is a juristic person? If I decide that we're all going to go into business together, we have to sign a, uh, we, we put an ad in the newspaper for several weeks in a row. It says our little group is doing business as Acme Fireworks. So seven, eight weeks later, whatever the time frame is, we have a company, Acme Fireworks. Do you know that Acme Fireworks is born? That's the terminology. This company is now born. Now, is Acme Fireworks human? Does it have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, a right to keep and bear arms? No. It's an artificial entity. It has whatever privileges that you and I and the state of Texas give it. A jurist is another word for the judge. The jury are the 12 people sitting there in the box. Anything which is juristic has to do with court. A juristic person is this artificial entity. Now, if I take us out into the parking lot here and I'm demonstrating my greatest, latest uh, bottle rocket and it works really, really good, except it burns down somebody's barn. Does the owner of the barn have a right to sue Acme Fireworks? Yes. How many people are suing Firestone Tires for their bad tires? So Acme Fireworks, for the purposes of court, can go to court just like you or I could. It is a juristic person, artificial entity. Now, with the 14th Amendment, the co uh, Congress has invented a juristic person. It is a, a non-existent corporation. So, we the people ordain and establish the Constitution. When we do that, we create Congress. So, who works for who? Congress works for us. They are subordinate to us. When Congress basically or presumably ratified the 14th Amendment, they created a U.S. citizen. Now, where's, what status does a United States citizen have to Congress? All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to its jurisdiction. You are subordinate to Congress if you're a United States citizen. So this is a second class of citizen. It was uh, generated just after the Civil War basically to give blacks privileges. So we thought that the 13th Amendment freed the blacks and brought them up to our level, except the 14th Amendment basically raised all, lowered all the whites down to their level. You have privileges. You don't have rights. The moment that you are born and they lay you on your mother's chest, you are, we the people, sovereign citizen. Suddenly, somehow or other, we go magically down to becoming a United States citizen. 
How does that happen? Birth certificate. Birth certificate. Social security number. Driver's license. Voter's registration card. Do you ever look at your voter registration card? Are you a United States citizen? Yes or no? Oh yeah, I'm a United States citizen. Oh boy, you have no rights. We the people have a right to keep and bear arms. A United States citizen has to get a concealed carry permit. We the people have a right to travel. A United States citizen has to get a driver's license. We the people can get married to anybody we want. A United States citizen has to get a marriage license. Those are all prima facie evidence of your subordinate status to Congress. The trick is getting rid of all of that. Since that says um, born or naturalized in the United States with capital letters, wouldn't that be places they have, like D.C. and the territories only? That's right. So it, the United there's I have a, another document that I literally just printed off the web yesterday. I'm constant again. There's too much information, so I keep adding more. Uh, but I, I downloaded a document that talks about. Uh, the United States, the United States, and the United States of America, three different entities, and the citizenships of each of those. And I, I would have added in the book, uh, best I can do is to give you the website before we leave. All right? So then the 14th doesn't apply to sovereign Texans. If you are a sovereign Texan, you are not a United States citizen. Okay. You never ever want to say, yes, I'm a United States citizen because you are admitting that you are subordinate to Congress. I am not a United States citizen. I am a Texan. So what if you, you want to vote? So how do you... You become an elector. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did they just change okay. the Constitution? What's that? Did they just change the Constitution two years ago to wipe that word out? Oh, did they? Yeah, two years Let's ago. See, I didn't, I didn't know that they had. So they're, they're trying to close doors on us. Before we before we You're finally get there, it's the same as a voter, right. which is not. It's not. Uh, so, United States citizen is different than a state citizen. A state citizen has rights protected by the Bill of Rights. A United States citizen basically has equal protection under the law. You want equal protection? That guy's got a ball and chain. You want to be equal? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it just says that it's equal. It doesn't say that it was good. So we're going to give you a ball and chain too. That way everybody's equal. Now, on my passport, I have I have reproduced the, what it says. It says, The Secretary of State of the United States of America hereby requests all to whom it may concern to permit the citizen slash national of the United States. What does it mean when you have two words divided by a slash? One or the other. One or the other. You can be boy slash girl. You can be Democrat slash Republican. One or the other. You can be citizen slash national. So this, this passport will work for a United States citizen, but it will also work for a United States national. They don't tell you what that is, but on my passport it shows that they are different now, what is a national? A person owning, owning permanent allegiance to the state. The term national, as used in the phrase national of the United States, is broader than the term citizen. So a, uh, a rectangle can be a square, but a square is not necessarily a rectangle. A rectangle is a broader term. So if you are a national, it is a broader term than the word citizen. So it is possible for you to be a national and not be a United States citizen. Shh! Don't tell anybody. We wouldn't want you to be able to exercise your rights. Now, um, in the reference that I gave you before, the USA, the House of Republic, is the USA. The Republic is the house that no one lives in is the document. And this is a short subset. And it says the 14th Amendment is a setback to proper government. It runs counter to the ideals expressed in the preamble to the Constitution itself. 
The the Fourteenth Amendment is also probably never properly ratified. So the Thirteenth, Fourteenth, and Fifteenth Amendments are uh, post-war amendments that gave uh, basically gave Congress a lot of power. Presumably the North over the South, but we've managed to exacerbate that into being even worse. Article 5 of the Constitution. The Founding Fathers realized they were not omniscient. They knew that we would have to change it. So Article 5 is all about amending the Constitution. How do you go about changing it? Well, the first thing that you have to do is propose an amendment. How can you propose an amendment? Either two-thirds of both houses or two-thirds of the state conventions. Do we have to have Congress? No. We can get each state to hold a convention and if you get two-thirds of those conventions to say, yes, we want this in a proposal, then it is proposed. You can bypass Congress. We, the people, still have some power. We just have to get our act together and get organized. Now, once a, an amendment has been proposed, how does it become ratified? The states. Three quarters of all the states. So, so you need, so you need uh, three quarters of the state legislatures. It's true. Mm -hmm. So you need a supermajority. You can bypass that too if you have Knox on your side. Oh yes, <laughs> yes, and, and we will talk about that. Uh, you can also have three quarters of the state conventions. We can bypass the state legislature, have a convention, and if three quarters of the peoples in the states want it, then the amendment is also ratified. But it's two thirds or sixty-six percent to propose it, and seventy-five percent. To, to ratify it. They deliberately made it hard. They didn't want it to be real easy. Um, number five, Article five, is on page 35. It says, all de debts and engagements shall be valid. Why did they have to put that in? Why is that in on Article five? Could we back up just a minute? Sure. Okay, in, in the Article 5 down here at the bottom, it says, uh, No state without its consent shall deprive, be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And yet, they passed an amendment in which some states, it would have had to have been unanimous for it to be legal. And some states did not pass it, so they lost their suffrage without their consent. Then it's unconstitutional. You, well, which which act are you referring? To? I'm talking about. Oh, it's over here where the senators are, senators are elected by the populace. Oh, the Seventeenth Amendment. Yes. Uh -huh. we, we're we're going to talk about the Seventeenth Amendment very okay. shortly. Okay. Um, Article six says that all debts, contracted, and engagements entered into before the adoption of the Constitution shall be valid. So we were changing governments. We were under the Articles of Confederation, and we owed a bunch of money to France and Spain for, you know, helping us out. So when we go to the new constitution, we say, well, we're going to be good guys and we're going to, you know, continue our debt. We're not just going to repudiate the debt. Um, but basically, it says all laws pursuant to the constitution uh, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority shall be the supreme law of the land. So the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and any law notwithstanding is invalid, is unconstitutional. So Texas can make any law that it wants, except a law that would legalize slavery, you know, or, or otherwise violate your rights. Uh, so, uh, oh, and then it's also said that all persons. Uh, senators, are, senators and members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers both of the United States and of the several states shall be bound by an oath or affirmation to support this constitution. So again we're supporting this trust idea. You've got to take an oath. You've got to promise to protect people's rights. 
but no oath or affirmation, uh, but no religious test shall ever be required. So we know we can't eliminate certain religions uh, or even atheists. You know, you can't have a, a religious test. Um, Article 7 is basically just signed, sealed, delivered, I'm yours. It just uh, says the 17th day of September, uh, 1787, blah, 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 and this is, you know, done and good. So the Seventh Amendment is mostly signatures, and the Sixth Amendment is, or the Sixth Article is relatively short. So the three that are, you know, typically important are one, two, and three, legislative, executive, judicial, Four establishes the relationship between the states and the federal. Five is how do you amend it. Six is we're going to keep our debts. And seven is we're out of here. Put your signature down. Yeah, so we properly refer to the government as federal or national? Well, <laughs> I'm just telling you what the Constitution says. I didn't say that I liked all of it. Mike, and some of those debts and contracts were with England also. Probably, uh, yeah, that may be true. France and Spain, but also yeah. England, they had to pay. Whatever, whatever the debts were prior, you know, during the uh, Articles of Confederation, those were all valid. So, so we were not going to be real scumbags and eliminate the debt just by refusing to pay. Okay. So, uh, uh, now, before it would be ratified, several of the states demanded that we have a Bill of Rights. It gives a whole lot of power to the federal government and we're worried about that. And so we want it, and they say, well, you got your rights. Alexander Hamilton said, ah, don't worry about it. You don't need to put that on paper. Yeah, right. You know, we want it in writing. So, most people know that the Constitution has a preamble. Most people do not know that the Bill of Rights also has a preamble. I was reading that in, the, in some book. It said the preamble to the Bill of Rights. They went, oh, typo. They meant t Bill of Rights, you know, preamble to the Constitution. And they started giving me something I had never read before. And I jumped up because I've got the Constitution and the Bill of Rights hanging in my hallway. And I went over and looked at it and I went, I'll be go to hell. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So the preamble to the Bill of Rights. The conventions of a number of the states, having at the time of their adopting the Constitution, expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers, that further declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added, and as extending the ground of public confidence in the government will best ensure the beneficent ends of its institution. So what? So we are uh, we wrote the Bill of Rights to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers. Whose powers? <coughs> Congress, the government. Okay? So we, we don't want them to get out of hand. So what are we going to do? We are going to add further declaratory and restrictive clauses. Does a declaratory clause ask for permission? No. no. I'm yeah. telling you that I've got freedom of speech. I'm telling you that I've got a right to keep and bear arms. I'm not asking. These are further restrictive clauses. We're putting restrictions on the power of government. What are the original restrictive clauses? The Constitution. So the Constitution are restrictions on Congress's power. And we're going to add further restrictions. The Bill of Rights cannot be repealed. You can't go in and say, well, we're just going to scratch out the Second Amendment. We don't need that anymore. Wait a minute. You didn't give it to us in the first place. You can't take it back. We gave it to you. We are telling you that we have freedom of religion. Not asking. So, but how do we stop them? Because we can get an amendment to change the Bill of Rights. Like we have other amendments. No, that is not true. You can get amendments to change the other amendments. The 18th Amendment established prohibition. The 21st Amendment repealed it. Right. But that has nothing to do with rights. If we can change, let's let's talk about Rosie O'Donnell because we're going to talk about all of these amendments, <laughs> right? 
Second Amendment, you know, the right to keep and bear arms. Rosie O'Donnell and her million moms want to go to Washington, and they say, all we got to do is just get enough moms to vote, and we're going to just repeal the Second Amendment, and we're going to take away, you know, your right to keep and bear arms. Okay, let's take that and say, you're going to repeal my Second Amendment, so I'm going to go to Washington with my billion fathers, and we're going to repeal your... You know, we're going to repeal the First Amendment. We're just going to take away your freedom of religion. You going to do that? You going to sit still for any of that? I say you can't go to church unless you're, you know, Branch Davidian. Ever going to change over to Branch Davidian? No. We didn't give you freedom of religion. You were born with it. Nobody can take it away from you. It is unalienable. It's a part of who you are. It's like the dreams that you had last night. You can tell me your dreams, but you can't give them to me. It, it's integral to who you are. You've got a heart, you've got lungs. You give me any of that, you stop existing. I can kill you, but I can't take away your right to life. I can violate your right to life, but I can't take it away from you. They cannot take away your freedom of religion, your freedom of speech, or a right to keep and bear arms. They can, the Bill of Rights doesn't give it to you in the first place. I understand that. But they can modify the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights, if we don't stop them. They can burn it. They can shred it. They can get rid of the Declaration of Independence. That doesn't make your rights go away. So let them make any changes they want. They can shred the Bill of Rights. They're, not, they're ignoring it so much anyway. Absolutely. The Constitution is only a, a national monument, you know, under nitrogen gas in Washington, D.C. It's a novelty. It is something to look at. Here, kids, what's it say, Dad? I don't know. It's the Bill of Rights. You think I know what the heck the Bill of Rights says? I went to a government-controlled school. I have no idea what my rights are. I don't have a concealed carry permit. Won't get one, don't want one, don't need one. Don't need permission from anybody. People say, well, you know, the, Supreme, the interpretation of the Supreme Court is the only one that counts when we're talking about the Second Amendment. Oh, really? Well, then you come and stand in front of my front door when the government comes to collect my guns. You're going to find out that my interpretation of the Second Amendment is the only one you need to be worried about. <laughs> Make sure you got your insurance paid up and kiss your kids goodbye. I'm not giving up my guns any more than I'm willing to give up my freedom of speech. Shred it. I don't care. It's a piece of paper. I am willing to stand up and defend my rights, whether anybody else does or not. And again, I ask you, how bad does it get, have to be before you are willing to stand up and fight for your rights? you got to know what they are. It's not a privilege. Nobody gave it to you. Now, they are printed, they are enumerated by the Bill of Rights. They are listed. Just why? So that we know what they are? Well, today, yeah. Most of us have got to read it to find out what they are. Why did we list them? Did we list them for us? For the government. No, we listed them for the government. It says these are the things that are our rights. Keep your hands off. So let's go through them rather quickly and briefly. Page 43. Um, and if you are going to continue your study, I hope you will, one of the things that I would recommend that you start with is to memorize the Bill of Rights. Oh, man, i got to memorize something again? I feel like I'm in school. Okay, how much is your liberty worth? Put it on a cassette and listen to it every time you're in the car. Okay. Um, 
Crystal has shirts with you know the Bill of Rights, and they're all printed upside down. So when you want to find out what one of them is, you just kind of bend over and look at your belly. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Marie has one on. Everybody. Everybody. There it is. Would you have one right there? Yeah. 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 <laughs> End of story. Congress shall make no law. I'm happy. Congress shall make no no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. To say anything about separation? No. There's nothing in the Constitution that says separation of church and state. That's the wild figment of somebody's imagination. <clears throat> I have no problem with people having the Ten Commandments in school. What bothers me even more is there's a school in Georgia that is prohibiting the display of the Declaration of Independence. If you can't have the Declaration of Independence in school, what can you have? Yeah. Um, so, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. These are personal rights. You have freedom of speech only in Scrabble and crossword puzzles? You only have freedom of speech in the things that I agree with? No. If, you, if that was the only thing, you wouldn't need freedom of speech, because we agree. You have freedom of speech even when somebody else, oh my gosh, I'm going to toss and turn all night. What you say just drives me crazy. I won't be able to sleep tonight. Too bad. <laughs> it's a personal problem. That's what freedom of speech is. So petition the government for a redress of grievances. We can sue the government and presumably win. The government works for us. One of the things that they're doing right now is they're taking a remonstrance to Washington. A remonstrance is a word you don't hear very much anymore, but it's a formal complaint against the government. And in this particular case, it's all about the IRS. Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Does it say anything about the National Guard? No. No. It said, well, wait a minute. What is that well-regulated militia? Well, today, well-regulated means lots and lots of laws. Back in 1776, well-regulated means well-prepared. You got a pound of powder and 16 balls for your rifle. And you know how to use it. Where do you think the Minutemen came from. You hear the bugle call, you grab your gun and you go. You're ready on a moment's notice. That is well regulated. All this talk about, well, militia means National Guard. The Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791. The National Guard didn't show up until the early 1900s. You telling me the Founding Fathers were premonition? Most people forget that the United States started when the British tried to take our guns at Concord and Lexington. We said, hell no. Texas started out when the Mexicans wanted their cannon back. What did we say? Come and get it. Third Amendment. You probably never hear of the Third Amendment being put to use. It says... No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Well, unless they change the way our soldiers fight, you don't have to worry about that. But back then, the army traveled on its stomach. They'd stop in town, stop marching, they'd say, okay, dismissed. And the soldiers would go knock on the door and say, okay, I'm sleeping in your bed, you're sleeping on the floor. Oh, really? Yeah, I got the gun. So, what's that? Yeah, well, armies, any army. You know, if you, if you were a civilian, you were basically just 
prior to the you know, stores. They were coming in That's day. right. Mm -hmm. So you'd, you'd be, you know, overrun by your army and the opposing army. Mm -hmm. So that, that probably won't uh, happen anymore. The Fourth Amendment, very important. It protects your privacy. It says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizure shall not be violated. And no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation. And particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. They have to have a piece of paper. You want to search? A, you have to have probable cause. What makes you think I've got anything? Two, you have to have a warrant. Three, the warrant has to be signed under oath or affirmation. Why? Because if you break down my door and you don't find what you're looking for, somebody lied. Somebody is guilty of perjury. And we go back to the First Amendment, and I'm petitioning the government for a redress of grievances. So we force the government to get an oath. We don't want the government just coming in and going, well, I think we're going to look around just in case. Can't do that. And if you let them, if they stop you on the side of the highway and say, can I look in your car? And you go, yes, officer. You just gave them permission. <laughs> no. You want to show me a warrant? Well, we're going to have to keep you here for three hours until we get one. Fine. I got nothing to do. Go get a warrant. And when it, you know, you don't find what you're looking for, be prepared for a lawsuit. You do that two or three times, and they're not going to check your car anymore. Is that true even if you have a license? Did you agree to yes. in any time? With the uh, now they're going to argue that if you have a driver's license, that you have given them pre, you know, permission in advance. By okay, by contract. Okay? Well, don't show them the license. You know, or get rid of it. Isn't that a state's car? Like well, if, if they've got it registered right. Okay? So, basically, you've got to be careful. You know, if you are a United States citizen, you have no rights. You are property. And you've got to do whatever they say. You are subject to the jurisdiction of Congress. So stop being a United States citizen. Now that's a completely different class, but we'll get around to it. <laughs> fifth Amendment. When everybody says, I plead the fifth, okay, they're talking about one line in this amendment. You look at that entire paragraph. Is that, I plead the fifth? No. There's a lot of stuff here. You have a lot of rights. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on presentment or indictment by a grand jury. Only people on the grand jury can indict you. The government can't come along and throw you in jail for anything you want. You have to have other Texans who say, yeah, that sounds pretty bad. Unless, uh, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war, public danger. So do soldiers and sailors have a right to all this other stuff? No. If you're a soldier or a sailor, you don't have a right to a trial. You go to a court-martial, which is completely different. You have no rights. If you're in the militia, when in actual service, you're acting as a soldier. So you get court-martial too. Now, um, nor shall any person be subject to the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. They can't hold you on the same thing. You know, they accuse you of murder, you know, they accuse you of killing John, and, you know, John shows up alive, well, you know, you didn't do it. They can't accuse you of it again. That was what the whole movie Double, Double Jeopardy was all about. Really good theory. Now, uh, nor be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. That's the fifth that everybody remembers. But it also says, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. They can't 
take all your stuff away from you and say, okay, we're going to take you to court. How are you going to defend yourself? You have to have due process of law. What? Admiralty jurisdiction? They, if, do, they do this with administrative law all the time. That's right. It's all administrative law. It's statutes. It's under the UCC. It has nothing to do with the Constitution. A lot of people go into court and they say, Your Honor, I've got my constitutional rights. And the judge says, Don't let me hear you talk about the Constitution again. What's the matter? I thought this was the United States. No. Not the United States that you're thinking of. Sorry. Eh, you lose. Because you didn't know the game. You're standing on a baseball diamond going, Touchdown! They go, We don't know what you're talking about. They pulled a fast switch on you. You've got to learn the law. You've got to know your rights. You've got to know where you stand. And your citizenship is a lot to do with where you stand. Finally, uh, you shall, uh, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Great. Who gets to decide what's just? They do. Sure. Maybe a jury. That that might help. But they can't just come in because the freeway's coming through and take your farm. We're going to find out. We're about to find out. I'd like to keep this. This happened during the Revolutionary War. They came with some hoax from private citizens to yeah. be used to move their money across. And so the citizens are saying, we don't want this happening. Right. That's what's compensated for that. Right. Okay. It's all based on property. Private property. <laughs> what's that? Who does decide what's just? Well, the Constitution doesn't specify, does it? So it's kind of like a little loophole. Wait till we get to the Eighth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. Why is a public trial important? Star Chambers. Yeah, we don't want to drag you off into a dark thing. Oh, he ended up dead. He was guilty. Really? What happened? What did we, well, it was his secret. You don't want to see that. Okay? They used to do that. They still do that if you ever you know, have a run-in with the IRS. We've got three kids in jail in Austin who were in jail because one guy confessed with a gun to his head. Oh, boy. No star chambers? Not in the United States. Could never happen here. Wake up! In all criminal prosecutions, it's going to be a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed. So you can't do something here and have them drag you off somewhere else. In the Declaration of Independence, it says that the king has uh, transported them beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. You know, the the tax collector would say something here, they would take you to England and you'd stand trial. Do you have any friends in England? Do you have any, your lawyer over there? You're all by yourself. It's really hard to defend yourself halfway across, you know, around the world. So the idea is wherever the crime is, that's where it stays. So the government can't drag you off someplace else. That way and the truth of the matter is that you were from there. You didn't never really travel far from your house. If you were a farmer, this is where you would have been. That's where the crime presumably would have committed. So this is supposedly allowing you to stay in your own county. Put on the bed. Darn good question. Yeah. yeah. Timothy McVeigh, yeah. Oklahoma, Denver. Right. Same same thing. But if we don't know what the Constitution says, we can't complain. It was another thing that they proposed to put a those cops dragged that black gentleman down in his car for Jasper. Yeah. Jasper? Took him someplace else, didn't they, in trial? No. Took him out of Jasper, didn't they? Oh, no. I think one of the things that happens is they accuse you of a federal crime. Well, if it's a federal crime, it's basically the United States. You know, anywhere in the United States is appropriate as far as they are concerned. But it's certainly not in the spirit of the Sixth Amendment, is it? Uh, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation. This is very important. 
What is the nature and cause of the accusation? You, if you get pulled over and the police officer says, I'm stopping you for speeding, that's the, uh, the cause. If you go to, go to court, and I'm learning this very quickly, they have cause numbers. Okay? And so that's the cause, speeding. What's the nature? Whether it is criminal or civil, you have to know which court you're in. You got rules of criminal procedure and rules of civil procedure. You got to know what rules they are. They've got to tell you. Um, and to be confronted with the witnesses against you. That way I can't whisper to Mike over here and say, oh, you know, gosh, these guys are doing it, and have them arrest you. Or really, who said so? Oh, a friend of ours. It's a secret. <laughs> You can't do that. You have to be able to look the person in the eye and have that person say, yeah, you're the one that did it. So that you know who you're fighting against. Uh, you also have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in your favor. If there were innocent bystanders on the street corner and they saw you being attacked first and you were just doing self-defense, you can force them. You can give them a subpoena and they have to show up. Now, you know, they'd rather be out fishing, but what if you were the one? What if you're the one being accused and there were other people, and I was standing there on the street corner and go, hey, it's your problem, not mine. Wouldn't you want to be able to, you know, force me into court to tell what I saw? So you have compulsory process for getting witnesses. If somebody saw it, they've got to be there in court. And it also says and to have assistance of counsel for his defense. Anybody see the word lawyer in there anywhere? If a judge tells you, you must have a lawyer. And, and I, was, I was fully expecting this. When you go into court, they say, you cannot represent yourself. You must have a lawyer. You ask the judge, excuse me, Your Honor, did you take an oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution? Are you violating my Sixth Amendment right? Certainly you wouldn't want to be guilty of perjury and treason. You have to be able to stand up for your rights. Nobody's going to give them to you. Nobody can give them to you. You need to draw that line in the sand. It's scary. It's not easy. But you've got to have the guts to do it. Or you don't have your freedom. End of story. Your choice. Seventh Amendment. In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by jury shall be otherwise reexamined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of common law. How many people here have ever been to a common law proceeding? Anybody here have any idea where you would go for a common law proceeding? How are you supposed to have due process of law if there are no common law courts? Does this, like, disturb anybody? I mean, we may not know what the answer is, but there sure as heck is something wrong. And it says, uh, in suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20. That's the why the price of the class. If, for some reason or other, you decide you want to uh, file a lawsuit against me because you're not happy with the course, you got ripped off, all right? You paid $20 and considerable, uh, valuable consideration. Your time is worth something. So that puts it oh, more than $20. You want to take me to court? It's going to be common law. And you have to prove that I violated your rights. Show me the property that I damaged. And frankly, I think I know the Constitution pretty well, so you're going to be in for a fight. <laughs> Eighth Amendment says, Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Define excessive. I had a $400 fine. I put down an $800 bond plus another $2,500 bond. 
as $3,300 for a $400 fine. Is that a little excessive? Yes. Ten times the amount of the, uh, the fine? Can I go with the Eighth Amendment? Well, I don't know. It doesn't really say. Who's going to judge? So it's a nice sentiment, but I don't know that the Eighth Amendment has ever actually been used. You go to common law of court and see the judge. The Ninth Amendment. Let's talk about the Ninth and Tenth Amendments together because they are legal bookends. The Founding Fathers understood that as good as the Constitution is, there are probably some loopholes in it. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments attempt to close those loopholes. The Ninth Amendment says the enumeration, we just list your rights, we're not granting them, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. Does the Bill of Rights say anything about a right to keep have children? A right to privacy. No. You have, you have doesn't say anything, but you have a right to have children? Yes. A right to privacy. You have Fourth Amendment talks it doesn't say privacy, but you have a right to be secure in your person's houses, papers and effects. So yes, that's privacy. But since privacy is a right, it is protected under this Ninth Amendment. Well, it's protected by the Fourth Amendment, too. Well, okay. okay. Not both ways. But travel. <laughs> is travel mentioned anywhere? No. Do you have a right to travel? Yes. So the Ninth Amendment basically says out loud, even though we didn't list everything, we, it doesn't list the fact that you've got a right to have a nose. We didn't bother to put that in there. But we, we listed some of them there are other rights that we did not list. So just because it's not written doesn't mean that the people can't do it. The Tenth Amendment basically is just the opposite. It says the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. That says if it's not written down, the government can't do it. They can't assume powers. Oh, that's what they meant. You know, it's not written there in the Constitution anywhere, but I'm sure that, that the Founding Fathers intended that. No! You want to give the government more power? You've got to amend the Constitution. Anything that is not explicitly listed that the government is doing is, by definition, unconstitutional. And we, the people, it's about time we read it, understood it, and started writing to our congressmen going, look, you can't do that. How many people are familiar with the space program? How many people have heard of John Glenn? Right? Everybody kind of like John Glenn? They were trying, somebody was trying to pass a law that said any law that Congress has passed, they have to reference the, uh, the article and clause from the Constitution that gave them that authority. And John Glenn said, we can't do that. You know, we wouldn't be able to pass half the laws that we do. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> what does that mean? That means that, you know, the Constitution is going to put chains on Congress. Gosh, we don't want to do that. We wouldn't be able to do half of the things that we're doing to the public. So we've got the chains. We just don't have a lock. You take your bicycle and wrap a chain around it, and you don't lock the two ends together. Is your bike still going to be there when you come back? Maybe not. Any questions on the Bill of Rights? Memorize them. They are very important. One short anecdote uh, about how important it is. I, I mentioned it a little bit at lunch. I got pulled over by the police. They said that they were going to call a tow truck and they were going to impound my car. I said, oh, really? I said, then you're telling me that you're going to violate my Fifth Amendment rights. <coughs> oh, no, sir, we're not going to violate your Fifth Amendment rights. So well, it sounds like it to me. Fifth Amendment says you can't deprive me of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. If you take my car, you're depriving me of property. You're not allowing me to travel to the airport, so you're depriving me of liberty. And unless you have, 
to be the judge, jury, and executioner, our little roadside chat here doesn't constitute due process of law. Now does it? I asked him if he had taken an oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution. He started to stutter. <laughs> the next thing you know, he runs off to talk to his buddies, comes back, hands me my passport, and everybody jumps into the cars, they slam the doors, and the police cars all drove away. Bye. <laughs> if you don't know your rights, you don't have any. If you're not willing to stand up for your rights, you know, it doesn't matter whether you know them. You have to stand up for yourself. No one is going to do it for you. Let's take a break. <laughs>